I joined after 20 years as a member of a law faculty. And I am very much enjoying working with uh, students in this new role that's dedicated to legal education. I, this is not actually a formal mission of the animal law program, but this is how I have been framing the work of the animal law program and our role. Uh, basically, our job is to make sure that the animal rights movement has knowledgeable and experienced attorneys. And that means that we have to expand and develop the law school programs, including the student chapters, which are crucial to the effort of, of building a core of animal law attorneys. Uh, but our mission also a little bit begs the question of why does the animal rights movement need lawyers? And so I want to take a few minutes this morning to talk about that question. Um, first, the animal rights movement needs lawyers because animal needs lawyers. The rights and protections in our society are recognized and enforced through a human created and human centered legal system. I'm not going to say that animals are voiceless. In fact, there's a good chance that you might hear the voices of the animals who live with me uh, before I'm done talking today. But the reality is, is that our legal system cannot hear their voices. And so they need the advocates who know how to navigate the system and who understand that animals have unique legal interests and who are willing to work to change the system so it will recognize and protect those interests. The law is a powerful tool for change. Law is the mechanism through which we order our society. In one sense, it's social and social movements that recognize the need for change and that push for the change, but it's the law that grapples with how to implement that change. Legal change happens through creative lawyering. Change happens when lawyers think outside the box, a, a phrase that I think is overused, but that I still use. But when lawyers think outside the box and think how existing laws and precedents can be used in new ways, which is ex exactly how we as animal lawyers need what we need to do. As we work to change the legal system, we need to take what we have, but change the context. This kind of lawyering does take a lot of courage. Um, often you aren't successful at first, but when you do win, it's a big win and you affect change that otherwise wouldn't have happened. This is exactly the kind of lawyering that ALDF does on behalf of animals and that you as students um, have, have, are starting to do. So lawyers are more than litigators. Um, advocates, legislators work in local government, um, you don't have to practice law to be an effective lawyer in the AR movement. I have never actually formally practiced law. Um, some of you do have working for uh, an animal rights organization as your goal. Others want to work in government or even private law firms. Some of you will end up as legislators or judges. Uh, some of you are going to work every day with animal law cases. Others will only see an animal law case now and then. But when you do, it's really important that you, as a knowledgeable attorney about animal law, it's important that you are the one who is there. Um, the animal rights movement is a social justice movement. Social justice movements concern themselves with the rights and opportunities of the most disadvantaged members of society and non-human animals suffer from systemic violence, oppression, and injustice. So the animal rights movement is part of everything that is going on in our society right now. The earth needs animal lawyers. The earth needs animal lawyers for all the same reasons that animals need lawyers. And right now that need is very dire. Um, this is the headline that made me decide it was time to take the work I had been doing in legal education and to take it into the animal rights movement. A million extinct species is a number I can barely fathom. In fact, when I first read this headline, I just sat at my computer and cried. Uh, and it, I thought then that, you know, this is a problem that as a lawyer, and a legal educator, I have the knowledge and skills to start addressing. And it's time for me to do that in a more active way. Um, truthfully, I used to say that when I retired, I was going to go to Africa and, um, and save the elephants, which was a little bit of an analogy. But um, 
I finally decided after I read this that, you know, I'm not going to wait till I retire. Why wait till I retire? This is what I want to do. I should do it now. Uh, and I certainly don't mean to suggest that legal educators don't make a difference because they absolutely do. And you're all working with, with some right now. Um, what I think though, the, my point here is that um, you can't wait. We don't have time to wait anymore. And sure, you do need to finish school first. Um, but as members of the student chapters, you actually are already starting to do this work. And I am so happy that you are there and that you are doing the work. Um, really happy and thank you. Um, we can't meet our mission, the, the animal law program mission of building a, a core and a, of animal law attorneys um, without our student chapters. It takes animal law courses and programs and opportunities in the law schools. Those are the most important tools we have to build up a core of lawyers for the animal rights movement. And our student chapters are the ones in the law schools who are not only providing right now some really super creative programming to educate your colleagues, but you're also the ones in law schools who are advocating for the legal education courses and the programs that the animal rights movements need. I am really happy to be working with all of you now and I get to, and, and I hope to uh, work more with you and get to know you more in the future. Hopefully get to meet you in person one of these days. Um, and, in, and in the future, I'll get to work with you in whatever role you end up in after law school. Um, with that, I am actually going to sign off and pass this over to Priscilla Rader Kolb, who is our legal education program manager. Um, and she is going to introduce you first to the rest of the animal law program team, and then to the members of our career panel who are an absolutely fabulous group of people who are working in the animal rights movement in a lot of different roles um, and for all of these reasons that we've talked about. It'd be helpful if I unmuted. Thank you so much Stacy. Um, we're so so lucky and thrilled to have you as part of the animal law program. And I did want to briefly introduce the rest of the animal law program team. You'll hear from all of us um, over the course of today and tomorrow. Um, but just to put some faces to names, you have Stacy, who you just met, um, myself, Priscilla Rader Colt, the education program manager. You'll also hear from Nicole Pallotta, senior policy program manager, Kelly Lavinda, senior student programs attorney, as well as Alyssa Sander. Animal Law, uh, the Animal Law Program Fellow. So thank you all so much for joining us today. And uh, on behalf of everyone with the Animal Legal Defense Fund and the Animal Law Program, thank you for joining us. I also did wanna give a special shout out to Elena Gavinos and Alyssa Nesman from our Project Management Program. We could not do these events without them. So thank you so, so much. All right, I am thrilled um, to, get started on our career panel. We have a great group of animal law experts with us today, and this is really your opportunity to ask them questions. To submit your questions, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. You might have to hover on your Zoom dashboard to have that show up. Um, if you did submit questions via email, I'll make sure to get to those as well. And if you experience any technical issues during the session and need some help, please contact us um, using the Q&A button. You can just put your question in there for tech support, or you can send us an email at events at ALDF.org. Again, that's events at ALDF.org, and we'll work to resolve your issue. Okay, so I will ask all of my uh, career panelists to join me on webcam, and I will be doing um, very brief introductions so we can get to the questions, but I do really recommend you checking out their full speaker bios at aldf.org slash student convention. The right hand side of that is speaker bios. I, I'm just, I'm so thrilled to have um, the five of them. They're all uh, experts in their field. Um, and we really did try to provide a variety. So uh, for all of you, because like Stacy said, there's so many ways to practice animal law. Um, you know, not just with litigation, but there's education, um, nonprofit work, legislation and government, um, criminal realm, 
small uh, solo practice. There's so much, so much. So our amazing career panelists will um, be able to ask, answer questions and really keep in mind that this career panel is going to be driven by your questions. So please do ask, um, don't be shy. We, we wanna um, hear from you. So, all right. So with me today is Kate Barnacow. Kate is the clinical fellow for the Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard University or Harvard Law School, where she graduated in 2019. Kate's interned for many top animal protection organizations, including the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and she was awarded the Dean Scholar Prize in Animal Law and received the Animal Law and Policy Program Writing Prize in, um, upon graduation. Eric Litzenstein is the Director of Litigation for the Center for Biological Diversity, where he oversees and coordinates the litigation strategy for the entire center. And before joining the center, Eric was the co-founder and managing partner um, of the public interest for law firm Meyer and Litzenstein, which as a law student, I would see in so many cases. <laughs> so very, very fortunate to have Eric join us. He holds a JD from Georgetown University Law Center. We also have Kelly Lavenda, um, as, as I already mentioned, she's our senior student programs attorney for the Animal Legal Defense Fund, where she oversees and manages the student chapter program. Um, a lot of you probably have worked with um, Kelly or at least have emailed her. Um, she is a Lewis and Clark Law School graduate and is currently co-authoring the first textbook on aquatic animal law. We have Nancy Perry, the Senior Vice President of Government Relations for the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, where she oversees the ASPCA's legislation efforts and policy work at state, local, uh, local, state, and federal levels. She received her JD from Lewis and Clark Law School, where she started the animal law program and the student chapter there, which was the first of its kind. Um, prior to joining the ASPCA, Nancy was the VP of Government Affairs for the Humane Society of the United States. And last but absolutely not least is the amazing Joan Schaffner. Joan is the Associate Professor of Law at George Washington Law School, where she teaches civil procedure, sexuality in the law, remedies and legislation regulation, and acts as the student chapter's advisor. Her current scholarship focuses on animal protection law, and there's a list of select publications in her speaker bio. Please just go read that. There's so much great stuff in there. Um, <laughs> so thank you all to the panelists. Um, that is it for me. We will now switch over to questions from all of you. And the first one um, for Joan, uh, what voluntary professional opportunities are involved uh, in animal law while you're a student. Hi all, um, first of all, I wanna thank you uh, very much. It's, I'm so excited to be on this panel with my fabulous panelists today. Um, and I, I also want, since this is an animal law panel, I did want to introduce one of my girls to you. Oh, wow. um, this is Liberty. Um, and anybody who can find Liberty's picture on the picture on the wall behind me, you get an extra credit. Um, Liberty and her siblings, uh, freedom, justice, and equality um, were my very first four kittens that got me started uh, in my feline sanctuary here at my home. So, uh, but I am very excited to be here with all of you. Um, you know, it's interesting, Stacy mentioned uh, that as an academic, you kind of don't feel like you're doing anything in the real world. Although I have to admit, I love being an academic and it's so important to me to try to, to share my passion and my enthusiasm. Um, I mean, for education in general, but certainly for animal law with all of you uh, students. So I do find it very rewarding. But to answer uh, your question, Priscilla, the one thing I decided to do that was outside of the academic realm was to get involved with the American Bar Association. And all students uh, can join the American Bar Association free, uh, along with five chapters. And there are, I want to be clear to everyone, we're doing a lot of great work uh, there for animal law interests. Uh, there are two animal law committees uh, in the ABA. One uh, resides, the, an the animal law committee resides in the tort trial and insurance practice section. Um, and the second, uh, resides in the international law section. Um, and they both have been doing some really great work. Just to give you some ideas of some of the things that we do, um, students have an opportunity for leadership positions. We have student vice chairs of those committees as well as student chairs of our various uh, subcommittees. 
uh, which we organize around the animal community, for example, animals used uh, for food, animals in research, companion animals, and the like. Um, you have a lot of great opportunities for professional development, uh, for publications, and also for networking opportunities to meet other people that are interested in animal law and working in animal law. We're also putting together mentorship programs for students and young lawyers. We have monthly lunch and learn programs, webinars, and a substantive newsletters that come out two to three times a year on current animal law issues. Um, we also, when we are able to do things in person, have fabulous public service events. Uh, for example, last October, uh, we were in Maui and we visited a farm sanctuary where we met some wonderful animals and we ended up cleaning out two barns. So we did a lot of work <laughs> as well as enjoyed meeting the animals. And finally, on the policy front, uh, the American Bar Association's House of Delegates, um, they vote on resolutions where they take policy positions. Um, and again, sort of following up on Stacy's point, while animals are not voiceless, um, at the American Bar Association, they more or less were not recognized uh, until the animal law committees were established. And over the last about 10 years, we've managed to get 10 resolutions through the House of Delegates, um, all designed to help promote animals' interests. Um, and just to give you sort of an example of some of those, um, we have had resolutions where the ABA is support, supports breed neutral laws and policies across the board, for example where they've supported banning private ownership of exotic animals, where they've actually supported the use of trap neuter return for the management of our relationship with free roaming cats. Uh, they've urged non-lethal police training for police encounters with animals. And our most recent, uh, which was just adopted in August, was they urged um, that all states and nations ban the sale of shark fins. Um, so we're doing some really great policy work on the American Bar Association front, and I just welcome all of you uh, to join us. I think you'll really find it's a great, uh, great opportunity, and you can stick with it uh, once you graduate, uh, whether you're in an animal law, um, you know, career or not. So thank you very much, Priscilla. Yeah, thank you, John. And I will uh, mention to the students watching, if um, anything is mentioned throughout this career panel and you want further information or anything along those lines, please do email us at events at ALDF.org. We're happy to pass that over to the career panelists and they can send over resources such as how to join the ABA uh, section. And I did want to ask if anyone else had any um, opportunities available for law students before graduation. Yeah, Nancy. I just have to say, I think that no one needs to give you permission to get involved in the political sphere. And what Joan just laid out are some really great um, ways to help ensure that there's a credible association weighing in. And that is something that in our world, when we're actually lobbying, we can take those recommendations and put them in the right hands and make sure that if someone thinks that a piece of legislation doesn't enjoy support, having the ABA behind it is really powerful. So those kinds of opportunities are amazing. I would also say that for my own experience, just getting involved in state legislation while I was at law school, going to Salem, attending hearings, testifying, these are things that you can do. And as a law student, you do bring a special voice to supporting or opposing measures. I would do that with a mentor or with someone who knows their way around the Capitol, but I definitely think that getting involved and, and tracking legislation and weighing in on it, whether it's federal, state, or local, is something that you can do, and it really informs your academic side with a more practical framework. And for me, it was incredibly inspiring in getting through the readings and getting through the, sometimes, you know, what can feel like, um, somewhat academic material or um, disconnected from the real world, because when you have that framework now that you're thinking about and how these issues might apply. Thank you, Stacey. Um, anyone else with opportunities? Great, awesome. Okay, Jordan is asking, um, so they go to Chapman Law in Orange County and they don't really have a big emphasis on um, you know, animal law or social justice in general. 
she uh, they tried to start a chapter but was actively discouraged from faculty so there's not a lot of resources and opportunities around um, the student what would you recommend they do to get experience in animal law world when your school's not really being receptive to that study and can uh, Kelly I'm gonna pitch that one over to you and then Nancy yeah I, I don't think you need permission from the faculty to start a chapter, to be honest. So I don't think that you need that. <laughs> so I would definitely encourage you to start the chapter anyway. I mean, ALDF, we have so many resources available for chapters. We have grants to fund any of your events. We have scholarships for members. Um, so I wouldn't let that be an impediment. And sometimes what we've heard from other chapters is that even the having a chapter at their school talking about animal law issues is not only educational for the student body but also for the faculty at that school maybe the faculty don't really know about animal law or don't realize how it intersects with a lot of other areas so i would say that's a great educational opportunity to also educate and work with the faculty there thank you and nancy jordan it's your job to do it anyway look at lewis and clark i will tell the dirty secret they didn't want animal law I met so many walls when we were setting up that program because it was an environmental law school and they, they really didn't see this as a serious topic area. And so we said, okay, well, we're just going to do it anyway. And we started it as a subgroup within the environmental law caucus and then became a separate group. But we just started bringing in credible voices. And Eric Glitzenstein was one of the first people who came and spoke at our conference and it just raised the bar and really demonstrated the seriousness of this issue. And it did take a lot of time, but your job is to plant the seeds for the future. And this is, this is a long-term mission that you're on at Chapman. You have other law school chapters nearby that you can coordinate with and network with, and that will really support you. ALDF and Kelly can set you up and connect you. You can bring in professionals in the area who will wanna come speak because they just want the opportunity to share what they're doing. So you have all kinds of resources to combat that apathy. And you could turn Chapman into a powerful place for animal law. Thank you, Nancy. Anyone else? Great. Yeah, and Jordan and anyone else in that, in that position, please do reach out to us. We're, we're happy to work with you. Spring is asking, and I'm gonna, um, pitch this one to Nancy um, because it's a policymakers question, but of course anyone can answer. Uh, how difficult has it been to operate in an administration such as ours with its numerous environmental rollbacks? And what advice would you give incoming policymaker uh, hopefuls on how to move forward in this sphere? That's a great question and definitely an inevitable one at this moment in time. Um, it's been very difficult and we knew that it would be. We also knew that even in the worst environments, there are sometimes fluky ways that you can break through on one issue or another. So we were hopeful that there might be some positives, and I think there have been a few of those. But for the most part, our job is to keep pushing back and on several issues like setting up extreme line speeds for slaughterhouses, um, removing inspections for Animal Welfare Act licensees. We've just had to keep exposing the corruption that we've seen around those issues. And sometimes our job is just to show a light on that. And we will use members of Congress to, to call the agencies and to send letters exposing what's going on. And I think that that's just as important. And sometimes what's happening during an administration like this, if you're not making forward movement, is you're setting up kind of a foundation for that policy to flourish in the next administration. So you, it's giving you a chance to create dialogue around the issue, to educate people about the needs. And to some extent, a lot of these issues operate behind closed doors. It gives you a chance to bring the issue out and talk about it, even if you can't make headway. And that, again, educates people, creates some momentum. And then hopefully, as we all know, the pendulum tends to swing. And we are hoping that the pendulum will swing and we will be able to then make some advances on some of these issues. So really for us, it's, it's that quality of perseverance and, and hope, and um, we're all hoping. Thank you, Nancy. Any follow-ups? Yes, Eric? 
Um, yeah, just to provide sort of a, a litigation complement to that, um, because Nancy's absolutely right about, uh, you know, what's been necessary to educate people about what's going on. And with this administration, it's almost been impossible, I think, to, for people to keep up with one outrage after the other. Um, but folks like Nancy and others have done a, a tremendous job of keeping these issues in the public eye, which will be critical to setting the stage for whatever comes next. Um, but in the litigation world in particular, um, you know, there has been so much defense that has been played, you know, as everybody I think knows over the last number of years. Um, and uh, it's going to be fascinating if we do have a change to a new regime, um, whatever that's going to look like. Um, we're going to have to have a huge transition period from thinking about just playing defense to thinking about how one can use the courts, but also the policy arena uh, to move forward. Um, you know, when all, you're spending all of your time just dealing with defensive emergencies, <laughs> which is what we've been dealing with, you don't even have time to think about what the future can, you know, and should look like from an animal rights and animal protection standpoint, wildlife protection standpoint. So um, over the next number of months, um, hopefully we'll be able to see what that looks like, but that has its own challenges, just so, just so people understand. I don't think we've ever had an administration that, at least in my experience, one could look at and say, oh, we could sit back and not have to worry about it. Um, you know, however good you may think an administration may be compared to what we have now, every one of these administrations needs to be pushed and prodded, litigated against, uh, advocated against, have their, uh, their policies uh, out there in the public arena. So whatever happens, uh, it's so wonderful that all of you are out there interested in pursuing these issues because we're going to need you going forward. Thank you, Eric. Great. And I will post this to any or all panelists. Um, how have, has COVID-19 affected your own, um, your own work or volunteering? Um, and do you have any words of wisdom or advice for how to kind of navigate during these unprecedented times? Kelly. And then Jim. <laughs> um, so we've obviously managing the student chapters, we've had to switch to kind of this more virtual environment. I think most people, most students are in that now. Um, even if you are allowed to have events on campus, they have to be really small. You're not usually able to serve food. Um, so it's kind of really changing uh, uh, us up from our regular programming. Um, so we actually have our student chapter program guide this year is on um, organizing for animals in the digital age. Um, so you can find the link to that at sal saldf.org. Um, and then, so that will give you some tips on virtual organizing and how to switch to that. And Joe? Yes, um, well, this is a little different, but interestingly, you know, I was talking about the American Bar Association. One of the things I'm actually going to be presenting next Friday to the International Sections Council, um, a proposed resolution. Um, and it is dovetailing, we specifically drafted this resolution to focus on what we've learned about COVID-19 and the interrelationship among the environment, humans, and non-human animal welfare. Um, I'm not going to mention what, what it is right now because it's somewhat, um, you know, until it actually goes to the section council first, has to be approved before we can even move it forward uh, towards the House of Delegates. Um, but you know, one of the things I guess is to always think about the silver lining, even when everything seems like it's a complete disaster, which I know that it has felt that way now for months. Um, but if anything that COVID-19 has demonstrated, like I said, it's raised, for example, in many people's minds, or at least reminded us, right, um, the systemic racism in our country. And I think we're finally maybe seeing that people are gonna start taking that seriously and the police and the like are going to take it seriously and the same thing with animal issues. Um, I, I hope that what it will demonstrate to us, even those people who don't care about non-human animals, is the way we treat our non-human animal friends directly impacts on our own welfare, right, the human welfare um, and the environment in general, which of course indirectly also or directly impacts human welfare. Um, so I think Part of what we need to do, and it makes it seem a little bit less horrific, if we can take that and turn it into something positive, ultimately from a policy standpoint. I love it. Thank you, Jen. Um, Kate, as a, as a fellow, how has um, the, your fellowship so far prepared you um, for a career long term in the animal rights movement? Um, and as a new or recent grad of last year, and kind of 
dealing with this COVID um, for 2020, kind of getting getting your wheels on and <laughs> getting going and then kind of having it stall. Can you um, sort of describe a little bit about what that's been like and any advice or lessons learned throughout that process? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. First, I want to say thank you so much to ALDF for having me. As Priscilla mentioned, I'm very new to the field, so I'm very honored to be among these panelists today. Um, so I am currently a fellow at Harvard Law School's Animal Law and Policy Clinic, um, headed up by Kathy Meyer, which is a new clinic, just started last fall, so about a year ago. Um, and I joined that fellowship right out of law school. So I tried to graduate and then came right back. So I'm still stuck in Cambridge for a few more years. Um, but it's been incredible. I I think the main thing that helped me prepare for this position and that this position is helping me to prepare for future positions um, is getting to work with some of the top minds in animal law, but also getting to see sort of firsthand how these policy litigation decisions are being made behind the scenes. It's really easy, I think, to see the great work, the outcomes of the great work that people are doing. Um, and just sort of think like, oh, we've got it, like this is pretty straightforward. But the measurements and the calculations behind all of this is really interesting to learn. And I think that'll be, especially learning from Kathy, will be incredible for uh, me going forward. I've, I've already learned a lot in my year here. In terms of COVID, it's definitely been interesting. Um, I think I was, at least I graduated pre-pandemic. I think it's especially worse for recent grads and hopefully not uh, future grads. Um, so I was lucky to have a two-year position, so I haven't been directly impacted yet, um, but looking forward to next year is interesting job hunting right now. Um, the most immediate Im impact for me is I had just moved into an apartment right across the street from my office that is now closed, so <laughs> I don't get to go into work anymore. Uh, but everyone's been great. You know, it's generally a really supportive field. I've never worked with anybody that I didn't think genuinely had everyone else's best interests at heart. Um, so everyone that I've worked with, both in, within our organization and outside of, has been incredibly understanding of the times that we're going through. It's been an adjustment for all of us, I know, to be on Zoom um, multiple hours a day, staring at our own faces. Um, but it, I, I felt really lucky to be a part of a community that's handled it so well and, and you know, tried to make the most of an otherwise really horrendous situation. Thank you so much, Kate. And yeah, it has been pretty you know, all things aside, it's been pretty amazing to see the community outreach and support that's been offered within the animal law realm and, and just how everyone's come together. So thank you so much for that. Um, this question is for Kelly and then anyone else who wants to add on. Um, is it recommended to get experience in some other areas of law or do many people just jump right into animal law and that is their path? <laughs> I think it depends on what you want to do. <laughs> um, so I would say if you're interested in like the criminal field, if you're interested in being, you know, a defender of activists, um, it's important to get involved in the criminal field when you're in law school and get to really know that thing. Um, I think some, sometimes students get really focused on, I need an animal law job this summer. Um, but I think most of us, when we're hiring animal organizations, we kind of look for your experience as a law student and, and an attorney like we want to hire really great attorneys and I think you can demonstrate your commitment to animal protection and animal rights in other ways so either being involved with your student chapter your school your volunteer work are you working in a shelter or a sanctuary um, so I would say whatever field you're interested in so if you're interested in legislation um, get some experience there and kind of worry about meshing it with animal law later if you can't find a position right now thank you yeah Eric Um, yeah, just to, uh, to add on to that, uh, both from my perspective, um, having run uh, along with Kathy, our firm for many years, and also in my current role, uh, I think one way to sum it up is that um, I think frequently what we're looking for are people who have both commitment and capability. Um, we need the commitment. We need to show people, you know, who care because this is hard work, long hours, um, and you need people who are willing to stick through it and really care about the issues. But that really has to be matched with people's, you know, demonstrated capability. And obviously, people graduated from law school don't have as much opportunity. But having been able to work in the real world, you know, while in law school, um, but also taking classes that give you sort of a well-rounded approach to things. I mean, animal law classes are great. As some of us on this panel know, 
Um, back in the day, there was no such thing. And due to a lot of the work by ALDF and others, now everybody can take in many places, not everywhere we know from this discussion, but many places animal law classes. But also if you can become, if you're gonna be a litigator, for example, you need to know administrative law. You need to know civil procedure. It helps to know constitutional law. Uh, people are out there doing, you know, First Amendment defense in this world. So I would say, uh, you know, coming with a well-rounded view, but also demonstrating that commitment, um, that's the kind of, you know, sort of complementary set of uh, attributes and skills, which I think uh, most folks would really find to be very, you know, important when you're stepping out and trying to hit the ground running, which is really what's necessary. You really want people, obviously a huge learning curve if you're just coming out, but what's really critically important in the kind of work we all do is people who have the tenacity, but also the ability to show that they can really hit the ground running in many different ways. Um, so uh, people like Kate from what I've heard. Um, so that's really an important thing uh, for people to think about being able to do that when they get out into that world. Thank you, Eric. I love that. And Nancy? Well, I was reflecting on how, you know, Eric, um, has always advised to take administrative law and don't just take it, really learn it. And knowing how things work empowers you so much and it makes you such a better advocate. And I think one of the other things that um, you may not always hear but is true is crawling inside the mind of opposition. So go work for some place that you need to know about because you may end up having to face them either in court or in another arena so that you can learn how they operate on the inside and what matters and what pushes their buttons. I really think those kinds of internships are as valuable as the ones that are squarely in the animal law field, um, if not more valuable. Thank you. Okay. So uh, this question I am going to pose to Nancy, but anyone can take it. Um, they're wondering if Nonprofit work is the only work that one can do without kind of betraying their values, um, such as working at, at the government level or, or at a private firm. Um, how do you balance, um, you know, your values not necessarily matching with the, the place of work or whatever it might be um, for, for kind of working within the system? All right, I'm gonna tell another dirty secret. Even if you work for an animal protection organization, you may sometimes not feel total 100% alignment with your own personal values because every place is different and every one of them makes different choices about content, strategy, um, how strongly to drive towards something. So you're always gonna be experiencing a little bit of that cognitive dissonance wherever you are in any workplace. But there are certainly some choices that would put you more in a position of feeling that tension. And so I think you have to have a clear mind about what you're doing there. Um, sometimes you're almost undercover trying to move the place you're in towards a stronger, more advocacy oriented voice. And that might be in a nonprofit setting, that might be in a governmental setting, I mean, just being there, being a voice in the room, being smart, being capable of offering different analysis to those that are making decisions internally could move the needle on helping animals in some tangible way. That's worth doing. And you know, think about um, those who go in and investigate horrific facilities with animal abuse. They are in cognitive dissonance that whole time. They are feeling that tension with their values but it's towards a greater end. And so I certainly don't think you should spend your whole life wrestling with that because the stress of that would be horrible. But I think that take chances, take, be open to having a chance to change some of the institutions that need change from the inside. Um, nothing you do right now is gonna consign you to one path. You can make some choices along the way. And especially now, I notice now people's careers you know, they move from place to place kind of rapidly. And I think that means that you have a chance to experience a lot of different things and work for a lot of different people that have, you know, good credibility in this movement too. That's another thing that is worth doing is identifying a variety of organizations and leaders that you might like to get to know. And that also helps when I look at resumes. I'm interested in seeing 
someone that has a number of contacts that I can call and say, hey, is this person really good? So I think that helps you too. Thank you so much. And this question is for Joan. Um, and Eric kind of touched on curriculum planning a little bit, but the question always comes up, um, should you take bar classes or should you take animal focus classes? How do you, how do you make the ultimate balance of your curriculum planning? <laughs> Thanks, yeah, I, I get this question about, do I have to take all the bar courses? You know, my answer is always no, <laughs> you do not, right? Um, um, I'm a, I like the generalist uh, view um, of uh, using law school to, to learn a, a little bit about a lot of things. Um, and now many people who may be on this, you know, because some people don't really know what they want to do, right? They come into law school, they're not quite sure. If people that are primarily here, you know you want to help animals. Remember that, I mean, animal law, quote unquote, intersects virtually every aspect of law. I want to reemphasize what Eric and Nancy said about administrative law and how important that is. But think about, um, I mean, and, and being an animal lawyer, there's both the private side as well as the public side. I know we've been primarily focusing on uh, nonprofits that are working towards sort of animal rights, but in the private sector, right, you can be representing companion animal owners and torts issues and wills and trust issues and family law issues and contract and issues <laughs> all can arise. Um, it, it, and many people that have sort of a private animal law practice, those issues arise all the time. Um, but they are across a, a variety of substantive uh, areas. Also, of course, international law and environmental law um, on, on the wildlife side, right? There's, there are so many uh, breadth of courses that will intersect with quote animal law that you know there's a lot of things to take. Now, with respect to the bar courses though, I mean, sometimes a bar course is, it's a bar course because it does represent basic fundamental skills that you need. So, and so for example, if you wanna be a litigator, you're gonna take evidence, right? Um, that's on the bar, um, litigators need to know evidence. Um, so it isn't really an either or, it's sort of a combination of thinking about where you wanna go, what type of practice you want to be in. This was also mentioned, whether you want to be a litigator, you want to go into lobbying, you want to go into the government, uh, you want to do academics or policy work, because animals need sort of people in all of those fields doing a variety of different things. And also think about the courses that will help you develop those skills in addition to the substantive law, right? I mean, like trial ad or pretrial advocacy courses or doing a clinic, whether it's in an animal related area or not. There aren't that many schools who have animal related clinics, but, but doing some sort of clinical work will develop those skills um, that Nancy and Eric and those guys are looking for when you get out, right? That you have some of those practical skills even before you leave law school. So um, I would say animal law is actually one of the areas where you could take just about anything and fit an animal law topic or issue into it. Um, so that's kind of the good news. Um, but definitely take advantage of being in law school and taking courses that you really enjoy because um, you've only got three or four years to do that and you're going to be out in practice for many many more years after that um, and uh, so I think it's 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 useful to take advantage of that I hope that answers the question but thank you yeah that was very very helpful Joan thank you Kelly I would just like to plug two things um, the animal law summer program at Lewis and Clark so they have um, two week two credit courses um, and so this year I think they were all virtual um, so you could do that from remote too um, so if you don't have animal law at your school or so you could take it there or if you're not going to take animal law because you want to take another course um, also I want to plug our animal law academy webinars um, that's a good way to get introduced into the topic if you don't have time to take it um, during school Thanks for the plug, Kelly. <laughs> um, all right, and this question is for Kate. Do you have any uh, advice for upcoming graduates who hope to obtain fellowships or similar placements? That's a good question. Um, I think the biggest thing you can do is to maximize the opportunities that you have while you're in law school. So as I mentioned, when I was in school, we did not ha yet have an animal law clinic, much to my chagrin. Um, and so I worked with as many different, I'm sorry, roosters here, which you might as well say hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, worked with as many different animal protection organizations as I could. I created my own sort of external clinics, if you will, um, both during the summer and then also during the semester, um, working remotely part-time, um, or working with uh, professors, worked with Jonathan Lavorn um, during my time in law school in order to get the experience as Nancy and Eric were talking about, 
not just a good grasp of the law, but a good grasp of the issues. So that when I interviewed for a new placement, whether that's a new internship or a full-time position after law school, I wasn't fresh to the issue, right? I, I had my demonstrated legal credentials, but I also had an understanding of the general animal issues and the work already being done in the field. So I think that's the best thing you can do. And if you know, you're at a, at a place where those sorts of connections aren't as readily available, if you don't have an animal law professor or somebody, um, obviously ALDF is an amazing resource. They can connect you with all sorts of people, but also just reach out. Like I've been amazed. People told me this when I was in school and I didn't believe them because I never was good at the networking thing, but people want to talk to you. Like I guarantee, I don't want to speak for my fellow panelists, but I'm going to, if you email any of us, we will absolutely write back, put you in touch with anybody we can. We want to know what you want to do and how we can help you get there. One of the great things about this field is that we're all in it because we actually care about it. You know, none of us are here for the great money it provides. <laughs> so like we, we want to help. Um, so don't, don't be shy, cold email, cold call. You know, we, we all want to help. Thank you so much, Kate. Kelly. Um, I just want to remind folks that um, for the Animal Legal Defense Fund fellowships, um, they're for anyone who's graduated in the past three years. Um, so I've known folks who couldn't get an animal law job right out of law school and got whatever they could to pay the bills or got a firm job and paid off their bills a little bit and then went into a fellowship. So if you don't get a fellowship or something right out of school, like don't stop trying and even the fellowships might be open to you if you graduated a few years ago. Thanks, Kelly. Nancy? I just want to chime in on that too. One of the things that this pandemic has provided for us at the ASPCA is some awareness that we need to get more comfortable with remote oversight. And we already do a lot of it with our staff, but with our interns, which is a very important part of our policy team for government relations, um, we actually had to shut down our internship program because we couldn't keep our office open. And that just felt like such a loss to us. And we really experienced that loss this year. On top of that, with all of the swirling conversation about DEI issues and inclusion, we realized that our field is incredibly privileged. And we do not have enough ways to give access to different voices in the lobbying world. And so what we've done is we reimagined our intern program. So while we had to, to shut it down for a while, we are reopening it in January as an entirely remote program. So now access for many of you is gonna be a lot easier. You don't have to find housing. You don't have to move somewhere. Um, yes, you lose the chance to be at the Capitol and those sorts of opportunities. And if we have a chance to provide that, we may be able to provide that in a hybrid manner going forward, but it does give more access to people. We're also really working to have a more diverse pool of candidates this year and going forward. We really want that to be part of the foundational principles for ushering in a new era, having much more equity in the room, much more inclusion. Um, we're going to have a workshop next Wednesday on the 21st at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time that is open to everybody here. If you want to sign up, you can just go to ASPCA.org slash intern, no, policy internship. And that will tell you all about what, what interns do with us. They're part of our family. They sit in the room as we're making conversations, we're having those conversations about what we should do, how to build up support around different legislation. So they're in on the strategy and they're a really critical link. So I think it's a, one good opportunity and it does, it is open and available to those who are in the graduation phase, you know, if you're even post-graduation. So it do, you don't have to be in school to engage in one of these internships and they're paid. So I hope that people will look at that. I'll post our flyer for that info session um, on the wall for this, this convention. Fantastic, thank you so much, Nancy. Um, and, and it sort of uh, goes along with my next question and I'll just pose it to anyone. Um, do you think that having to adapt to a virtual environment because of COVID will open up opportunities for remote animal law positions in the future? And um, how do you think this might um, create new opportunities for graduates coming up? Anyone wanna take that? Kelly. Yes, yeah, so at Animal Legal Defense Fund, um, we've had to switch to uh, 
fully, if not mostly remote um, work environment for all of us. And we had a little bit before, but now we're moving into most, most people are working remotely. I um, mean, we were the same as Nancy. We had to kind of quickly try to change our intern, our internship clerkship program. Um, so our clerkships, so our summer clerkships used to come in to be in our office, either in Portland or California, um, but now they're both remote. So hopefully the same thing, it's more um, equitable and more people can apply now. Um, and I forgot the second part of the question. <laughs> can you remind me? Oh, just uh, if you think that this will open up opportunities for graduates to come for like positions uh, being converted into remote work or any new uh, new opportunities. Yes, yeah, so I, I think most of our Animal Legal Defense Fund positions now are posted. You you can work remotely too. You don't have to be in any of the offices. I'm, I'm not sure if other organizations are switching that way, but since we don't really know when this pandemic is going to end, if it's going to be six more months or, you know, 12 more months or more than that, I think that most organizations probably have to be looking forward that way. And I think that's gonna open it up a lot for people because I know moving can be a really big um, impediment to getting the jobs in animal law. Thank you. Yes, Eric? Yeah, actually, interestingly enough, um, the Center for Biological Diversity always actually encouraged and had a lot of people working remotely um, because it was a grassroots organization to begin with. And so in some respects, it was, I think, better positioned to respond to the COVID-19 uh, uh, issues than, than might have been the case for some organizations. And um, has really, I think, in some respects benefited from that. And so I strongly encourage people who might be interested in working you know, for the center uh, to take a look at that. Because I think going into this uh, crisis, but then coming out of it, there will really be an emphasis, I think, on people who are able to be, you know, self-starters, work uh, independently, which is not to say there's not a value to people able to get together physically in the same place at some point. But, um, you know, there really has been, I think, uh, a set of skills that, um, you know, some organizations are going to emphasize more. So being able to do that and take advantage of that is something I think is really, it'll be fascinating to see, obviously, um, how all that transpires. But um, certainly for people who might be interested in the center and who are, are have these have this ability and have proven that um, wherever they happen to be, um, it's really opened up that kind of opportunity. So uh, the center does hire on an ongoing basis. Um, I don't do a lot of hiring myself personally, but there are program areas that do. So people who are wherever they're in the country, if they're interested in um, you know that kind of work, um, absolutely you know, think about continuing it and don't be deterred by the fact that you happen to be in a remote place because some of the best work that's being done is people who are very far flung places, but having a huge impact all over the world, you know, as well as in the US. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'm going to pose this one to Joan. Uh, it, it's a, uh, yeah. Is animal law traditionally taught more from an animal rights perspective? Uh, I'm currently taking animal law, and my professor has been very vocal against animal rights issues and animal, animal rights organizations, and I thought it would be more animal rights focused. Do you have any guidance for how to um, navigate a class like that, especially if it is the only animal law course being offered? Hmm, I have to admit, I am a little surprised. Um, I'll also have uh, both Eric and Nancy join me on this one too, because they they actually teach our animal law course. I don't teach our animal law course at GW um, because I have much better people available as adjuncts to teach at GW. Um, but interestingly, I mean, I do know many of the, and, and I was going to say from an academic perspective, you know, what, we would really love to have more academics that are actually focusing their work on animal law. Uh, it's terrific. It's absolutely spectacular to have adjunct professors teaching the animal law courses. Um, but until we have sort of a ground swell within the law school, that as the student from Chapman, for example, raised, um, it perhaps I think what the student was thinking is the, the faculty wasn't willing to add an animal law course to their curriculum. And if they don't have any faculty that are interested or even see a connection with animal law, that makes it difficult. As everyone said, you can have a Saldiv chapter, you don't need faculty approval for that. So definitely move forward with your Saldiv chapter. But you know, for the curriculum, you do need faculty uh, approval. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, most of the people that I know that teach animal law, whether it be, uh, or are focused in animal law, whether it be full-time professors or adjuncts are typically on the animal protection side of things. So I am a little surprised uh, to hear that. I'm assuming, um, and I don't wanna, 
um, say anything uh, inappropriate here, um, but if it is taught by an adjunct professor, you could consider finding someone else to teach the course um, moving forward. Um, I know that's not, you can't do anything about that within the, within your curriculum right now. Um, I would just, you know, ask questions, right? Probe uh, the, the, the professor um, in terms of, you know, if, if they're coming across with a particular perspective and you understand something from a different perspective, but make it legal, right? You know, you don't want to just, this is my opinion about something, right? Try to probe in a very sort of, le in a legal manner to, you know, to sort of get them to understand uh, maybe the other side of the of the argument. Um, you know, I do know that there are a lot of attorneys out there. Uh, I think this is more on the environmental side, perhaps, uh, and wildlife issues than necessarily on the traditional animal law side. But you know that a lot of attorneys are working with companies to figure out how to get around things like the ESA and, and the like, right? Um, and so, if you have an adjunct professor who's sort of with that mindset. Um, they bring a different mindset. Um, but by the same token, I think it's very appropriate to, to ask questions and challenge the professor uh, with respect to, to, to some of those issues. But, but like I said, have, um, have a good legal argument to make uh, when you are addressing those questions to the professor. Very helpful, thank you, Joan. And Nancy? Can you imagine if you had a feminist legal theory seminar and someone taught that course from a anti-feminist perspective. Can you imagine if you had an environmental course that was only about harming the environment? Or what if we had a race and law course where we had a white supremacist viewpoint represented? I mean, that is, that is if it's not at least even-handed in the way they're handling the conversation, it just seems inappropriate to me and I would go after it. And perhaps the universe has recruited the student who raised this question to do exactly that um, it seems like there should be opportunities to address that. But anyway, go ahead, Kate. I appreciate that. Um, I think that as long as you're in that course and in that situation right now, sort of as Nancy was talking about, sometimes when we're undercover, learn from it. Um, I had a classmate who took environmental law with me and I was really shocked to see him there because I know uh, what he's doing now and what he intended to do. And he was purely in the course to learn the loopholes. Um, so do the opposite, you know, take the ALDF webinars, learn as much as you can from the animal rights perspective, but learn what they're teaching and learn the ways that they try and get around basic protections and rights for animals so that you can use it against them. Okay, very, very helpful. Thank you all. All right. And uh, this is also for Kate. So um, as a student, did you find it more beneficial to focus on the animal um, rights portion of your, you know, uh, extracurricular activities or for the legal aspect of it? Um, if you had to choose, you know, a non-legal animal rights volunteer position or a legal non-animal volunteer position, do you, do you have any guidance for how to kind of make those decisions? Because I, I feel like they often come up where you're having to choose between one. Sure. Um, absolutely take a legal position when you're in law school. As folks were talking about that we need good lawyers and you can learn the animal issues out of law school, but you, you're not going to get another chance at that training. Um, so flat answer, that's easy. In a more general perspective, in, in terms of my own studies, um, I did a lot more of the sort of core bar courses in maybe the first half of my law school career. Um, and don't get me wrong, I continued to take them and took them seriously for the rest of my time in law school, but I really did focus more, not purely on animal issues, but on practical work. Um, so I did, I took as many credits as they would allow me to take as um, externships and practice and worked with um, the different clinical staff we have at the law school as well as organizations outside um, and took any of those sorts of real world opportunities I could. And I think that's been incredibly beneficial. So I don't think that was really the question, but I want to plug that in too. So, but, okay, so focus on legal issues, but get as much real world experience as you can too, because you could, you know, be able to recite precedent back to the beginning and doesn't mean that you're actually, you know, capable of sort of handling the day to day things that as a lawyer or as, or as an animal rights lawyer, you will be doing. Oh. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> I, uh, what I'm seeing more and more is um, students who are focusing on kind of uh, issues that intersect with animal rights or animal protection. So maybe they're working for an immigrant rights um, clinic or something like that. And that will intersect with a lot of slaughterhouse workers who tend to be undocumented or immigrants. Um, so what can we do there? Um, workers' rights, environmental. I mean, there's so many different ways that this intersects with other social justice movements. So, and sometimes people coming from the animal perspective only, like we don't think of those intersections. So it'd be great for you to get experience to realize, oh, hey, this is intersecting there. Like, look at how these slaughterhouse workers are being treated can we get an animal rights organization to start focusing on that issue because then that will help the animals in the slaughterhouse as well we're talking about if we're talking about lion speeds or something like that um so i would just be kind of open to seeing those connections um and see if you can make it happen great thank you and this is for eric um but anyone of course can answer how do you, how can and do newly minted attorneys practicing in a field not directly focusing on animal law still stay involved in animal law while practicing? Hmm. Um, well, I think it depends in part on how related the field is. So, you know, we keep talking about um, overlap, for example, between environmental law and, and animal law. As someone who's never quite seen, you know, a particularly sharp division between those things and sees a lot more overlap than there is in a division. I think one of the things as we increasingly are, are seeing these days, seeing animal interests in terms of captive animals, but also worldwide extinction as we were, you know, we got into this whole discussion. Um, so I think that being in whatever field you're in, but as we were just saying, even if you're in a nonprofit group working on social justice issues, uh, one of the things that um, people really have looked at at the organization I'm now working for is how do we bring the whole Black Lives Matter issue to bear on how we think about issues and how we approach what we do, because I think as we all recognize and we can't divorce these social justice movements. If you basically have compassion for living creatures, those, that should extend to all living you know, creatures, human and, 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 uh, and, and non-human. Um, so I think whatever you go into, look for opportunities to bring your concern for animals into whatever you're doing. Um, obviously, it's a nonprofit organization, bring that perspective in, but also continue to you know, associate with groups like ALDF and do volunteer work on the side, whatever it may be. Um, and there are opportunities to expand what you're doing. I mean, just to use one example, there's a, a wonderful attorney at the center, Hannah Connor, um, who has kind of an environmental background, but she's increasingly doing more direct animal work and is partnering with um, some of the uh, animal rights, animal protection organizations to do cases that have both an environmental component and an, and an animal protection component. Uh, and I think that's a tremendous way of reinforcing how all these interests come together. So um, that's kind of a, an amorphous answer. People may have a more concrete one, but I just thinking, you know, in those kinds of terms and how you can continue to promote your animal interests while whatever else you're doing and bringing that into your work, um, and there's opportunities to do that, but just to think in a very creative way about how you can continue to expand your focus that way. Yeah, that's perfect, Eric. Thank you. Uh, Kelly. I would also like to plug another ALDF resource. So we have a pro bono program. Um, so you can sign up as a volunteer attorney. And so we use volunteers attorneys at Animal Legal Defense Fund to be active throughout the whole U.S. That's why we're able to bring cases anywhere that we want to, really. Um, and also, we will help other animal protection organizations or even members of the public um, get paired up with an attorney. Um, so that's a way to um, be active in the field. Um, and then, as Joan mentioned earlier, the, getting involved in the ABA section. Um, or I would look to see if your state bar has an animal law section. A lot of them do. And if they don't, you start one. Um, we can also help you that. Our pro bono program provides some resources and support. Um, so again, just reach out if you're interested in learning more about any of that. Nancy. Joan, did I jump in front of you? Go. You go and then I'll... Yeah, I think so. Sorry. No, 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 no. no. It's, not, it's okay. I'm actually going to turn it a little bit. You know, we were all talking about legal work and I know we're all here about legal careers, but I know everyone on this panel and most people who are interested in, in animal law, we all have, we're mentioning volunteer work, right? But you can do non-legal volunteer rescue work and the like, working with shelters. Um, I alluded to the fact that, you know, I have five beautiful paintings behind me here. That was just the beginning. I live in a feline sanctuary. My entire world changed when I, when I learned about animal law. 
And it really, you know, it's, it adds, and the, the, I guess the student who asked the question, how do I maintain sort of finding a job and, and maintain my passion? Well, your job, job hopefully will be consistent with your passion, but on the side, right, or quote on the side, my entire life is really taking care of cats now. And it has been so rewarding to me. Uh, I'm so thankful that I learned about animal law because of the other work and volunteer work that I've started doing. Um, and if you can actually see that you're helping individual lives, right, um, that is just so rewarding. So remember, that's the other part of our life that um, we can also involve animals, even if it isn't our legal career per se. Yeah, it really helps prevent burnout because things move very slowly in our professional lives. So it's good to it's good to spay or neuter a cat now and then, or it's good to, you know, help foster, you know, an animal or do, there's so many ways you can just put hands on and feel like, see that animal move from, from bad to good. I will just also say that sometimes not being part of this effort overtly, this movement um, can be an asset. We have an active volunteer network of district captains that we work with around the country that are set up in congressional districts having them be professionals in other realms and have credibility in that realm is incredibly valuable. When they go to reach out to a legislator, it's not just some animal advocate, it is a lawyer representing, you know, immigrant rights or it's, you know, whatever, whatever the field might be, it could be a business area and that can add a lot of credibility to the message. So don't undercount how you can wear different hats and be effective. Thank you. All right, it looks like we have time for one last question, and I do want to pose this to anyone, all of you, um, and that is, what would you like to see from the next generation of law graduates pursuing animal law? Anyone wanting to start? Kelly. <laughs> I think, um, as we've kind of talked about today, um, kind of like a direct protest and direct action, I think is going to get more popular as the world, um, as Stacey mentioned, sees more extinction and more things happening. Um, so I would like to see more um, attorneys who are defending activists, the people who are on the ground doing that work. Um, what can we do to help um, protect them and protect their rights um, in doing that? Thank you, Joan. Yeah, it's interesting because I thought about this before too, but the theme that also came out that Eric, I think, and several people have alluded to is both the collaborative, creative, and diversity, right? Um, I think um, seeing how non-human animals' interests intersect with a variety of other human and environmental interests is, is going to be a, a help in terms of promoting their interests along with everyone else's and raising that visibility. Um, both legally as well as uh, otherwise. You know, the other thing we were talking about is the media is so important, right? I'd love, it's what, I love when I get a journalist call me and they're gonna write a, a story about an animal law topic and they wanna ask me about it because journalism I think is another huge area where if you're interested in writing, um, that helps raise the visibility in public education, which is really what we need to start before you know, the courts are the last ones, from a litigation standpoint anyway, that are willing to push the ball, right? And even the, you know, even the legislatures, um, until the public kind of gets behind you, um, it's hard to move the legal ball. So those of you that, you know, there was, I think, a question about what non-legal jobs can, can help. I mean, I, I definitely think journalism and raising public, uh, public education around non-human interests um, and the diversity of those, of those issues and how they, they intersect with other justice movements is really an important way to go. Thank you, Joan. All right. So that is um, our career panel. And I just wanted to thank all of our fantastic career panelists for joining us today. Um, great questions, great conversation. Thank you so much for your thoughtfulness and guidance. And a panel, a recording of this panel will be available on the virtual event platform starting tomorrow. To view the recording, you can go to the agenda page, click on the career panel session, and then view, click view recording, and that will be up there. So thank you once again, Nancy, Kelly, Eric, Joan, and Kate for joining us along with your wonderful companion animal cameos that we got. Um, always enjoy those as well. Thank you so much, and we will be back here 
um, in 15 minutes or so, um, I believe about 11, uh, 20 minutes. So 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. for uh, Eastern. We'll be back here for the keynote and the chapter of the year award. So thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to the students for joining us and we'll see you soon.